Hey everyone, and welcome to a brand new video. Tonight we have eight stories coming out to just a little bit over two hours as per usual. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. It helps out so much with the algorithm. Let's see if we can hit 1200 likes. Subscribing if you are new is also very much appreciated as I post content just like this all of the time. I'm very happy to finally be recording again. If you don't follow me on Twitter, you're probably not aware of the fact I just got done driving across the country because my girlfriend and I decided to move in together. So I'm no longer in my little Minnesota apartment. I'm living in California, living in the big city, and I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, I've spent quite a bit of time out here, and I don't know, it's really cool to finally call it home. My dog loves it here too, so it's pretty much official. Anyway, enjoy the video, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. My days of being a nosy neighbor are over. It started about a month ago when I was pulling in from work. I saw a tall, slender-looking man fiddling with a pair of keys in the door of the conjoined duplex right next to mine. I usually stayed to myself in most instances, but thought it'd be rude to just walk straight into my home without at least introducing myself. I walked up to him as he was starting to open his door. Hey there. The man had nearly jumped out of his skin and quickly turned to face me. He had a fairly pale complexion with dark black hair, while his eyes were hidden behind a pair of sunglasses. Hi. You'd think I'd know how to work a key by now. He shyly responded with a slight smile while extending his hand. I'm Troy, your new neighbor. Nice to meet you, Troy. I'm Danny. I grabbed his hand, which oddly seemed a bit sticky. As Troy swung his door fully open, I could see his eyes light up. Wow, lots of room for activities. That was kind of a weird comment to make, I thought. What was even more bizarre was all of the furniture left over in the house. I looked back at his driveway and noticed he only had his car sitting there, and all Troy had on his person was a Polaroid camera around his neck. Curiosity finally got the best of me. Did you pack pretty light? Troy looked back at me with a perplexed look. Oh, <laughs> yeah. The movers are going to be a few days late. He stood in his entryway looking at me like an NPC waiting for their next command. I took this awkward moment as my chance to get out of there. Well, let me know if you need any help unpacking when they finally get here. Nice meeting you, Troy. He kept staring at me and smiled. You too. Troy began shutting his door, but stopped just before it was fully closed. I could see his face glaring at me through the crack in his door. Our new neighbor is pretty damn odd, honey. My wife had just gotten back from picking up some groceries, and she was already hearing it from me. I just think it's bizarre how Sarah, our landlady, always happens to find the weirdest of tenants to rent to. My wife sighed. Well, he's probably a step up from the last guy. Greg? That's a pretty low bar. How did Sarah even find a tenant so quickly? I hadn't seen Greg in a few days, but I had no idea he moved out. After dinner, I went to roll out our trash bins to the curb and happened to glance over at Troy's place again. The door was still propped open, a little bit more than earlier. I squinted as nonchalantly as I could and could have sworn I saw the outline of Troy's face creeping through the darkness. My god, Danny. He was not waiting in his doorway watching you. You're just being paranoid. My wife apparently mistook my intrigue as paranoia as I gave her the details of my latest Troy sighting. How do you explain him having his door propped open then? I don't know. Maybe the AC is down and he's trying to bring in some fresh air. Greg probably tarnished that place with all the smoking he did. As my wife said that, my eyes wandered outside to see Troy struggling to bring in a pretty sizable sleeping bag. I wanted to make more of a case with what I had just seen, but... Maybe she was right. I was done debating for the night. We both hopped into bed, 
turned on our TV, and watched a few episodes of a series we were binging before we both fell asleep. I went back out the next day after work to go bring our trash bins in when I felt a sudden tap on my shoulder. Hello, Danny. He couldn't even look me in the eyes, but I noticed Troy seemed a bit more excited. Oh, hey, Troy. How's the move going? It's going well, thank you. I'm having a game night tonight. Would you and your wife care to join me? My wife was going to be out at her friend's bachelorette party. So that left me with an empty home, and it also left me with no plans or excuses. Luckily, my previous career in sales made me an expert bullshitter. Ah, uh, sorry, I can't. The wife and I are going out of town to see her in-laws. Maybe some other time. Gauging from his facial expression, I could tell he was pretty disappointed. I gave him a wave goodbye and started my way back in when I heard him mutter. You know, we can't play unless you come in, Danny. That line sent a chill down my spine. But I tried to keep it cordial and did my best not to engage. Enjoy your night, Troy. My wife brought back some B-dubs before heading out to her bachelorette party that night. So I kicked back, cracked open a couple beers, and turned on the TV to celebrate the start of the weekend. An hour or so in, I heard a car door slam outside. I looked out our window to see three people, two guys and a woman, walking up Troy's driveway with bottles of liquor and a case of beer. I realized I had seen these three previously when Greg was living next door. I'm pretty sure they were his rowdy drinking buddies. Maybe that's how Troy had heard of this place. Perhaps Troy was just one of Greg's artsy stoner friends who happened to sublease for him. Usually, it'd be annoying to see a bunch of college-aged kids going in for a house party. But seeing those three relieved me a bit. It was good to see Troy at least had friends. It humanized him a bit more. Those cheery thoughts of mine were soon interrupted when I heard them pounding about almost immediately. And soon after that, they were blasting some pretty odd music on and off. I was back to being annoyed as I thought about slamming on the wall to get them to quiet down. But then I remembered I had lied to Troy when I told him that we would be out of town. I buckled down and just dealt with it. As I was getting ready for bed, I heard the slam of a car door and the rev of an engine as it peeled off into the distance. Finally, some peace and quiet. I woke up in the middle of the night, needing to take a piss. As I rubbed my eyes and turned over to get up, in my peripheral, I thought I saw something scurry through our hallway. It was incredibly brief, but it almost looked as if someone had just crab-walked past our bedroom door. I grabbed the baseball bat I kept underneath my bed, and approached my hallway with shaky legs and looked both to my left and right. Nothing. I turned on all the lights in our place and searched our entire place, but came up with nothing. After taking the most frightening piss of my life, I saw our porch motion lights had gone off. This sounds like an incredibly dumb move, and maybe the baseball bat gave me a little too much courage, but I decided to step outside to see what it was. There was a certain stillness outside, but something immediately felt off. In the distance was a rustling noise. A few steps out towards my driveway, I found where the sound was coming from. Troy's place. The rustling was followed by a giggling sound. I peered around the corner to see his door was again propped open, but even wider this time. Almost fully open. The perspective gave me a full view into his entryway and living room. In the corner of his living room stood Troy. Back turned to me wearing nothing but his briefs. He dropped something and stuttered, You're here to play. In that moment, I felt frozen, but I did my best to puff out my chest and called out, Troy, is everything all right? Just then, he darted across the room to hide behind a wall. Another giggle. His pale face popped out from behind the wall. Troy put his right hand over his mouth, and pointed at me with his left and started giggling. His motion was so unnatural as he ran across the room, arms flailing above him to hide behind another wall, 
and started giggling again. His arm poked out to grab the item he had dropped earlier. Come on, what are you waiting for? He popped back out to stare for a second and then hid back behind the wall. A few seconds go by and I began to hear a childlike whimper. Why won't you, you play? I started to find my footing again and began to back away. I reached for my phone to call 911. Why won't you play? Just then, Troy started storming towards the front door with a knife. I quickly slammed it in his face and ran to my car. He pounded on his door from the inside as I threw my car in reverse and quickly got out of there. My call to the cops didn't initially lead to much. They said they checked out the place, knocked on the door to no answer, and that they couldn't do much without a warrant, but that they'd keep an eye on the place throughout the night. Luckily, my buddy Drew was able to wake up to my constant barrage of calls and let me crash on his couch. I texted my wife what had happened and to not go to the house that next morning here, and I met for breakfast and called our landlady Sarah afterwards. Hey Sarah, we were just reaching out to let you know that we've been having some issues with your new tenant next door to us. There was a deafening silence before she finally spoke up. What are you talking about? What new tenant? A breaking and entering report was enough to finally get the police involved. They asked me a few questions about Troy, but I feel I didn't give them much help as to who the guy was. Sarah apologized to us profusely. She mentioned being at a funeral that week and felt terrible for having us been wrapped up in this situation. She couldn't tell us much other than Troy had apparently gotten a hold of Greg's phone and his house keys, and that there was an ongoing murder investigation. Sarah gave us the unfortunate news that Troy was still out there, but she would do everything in her power to make sure we felt safe. A few patrol cars would continue to monitor our place for the upcoming weeks, and Sarah had installed a ring alarm system. While we appreciated her concern, this was enough of a sign that we needed to move. We had saved up enough for a new place anyways, and this was the best excuse to get our asses moving. We got extremely lucky and found a place within our range and a few days ago we had finally got everything packed up and ready. The movers packed everything up yesterday morning and as they were backing out, I saw a manila envelope placed on our driveway. I opened it to read a note that simply said, We still need to play. My door's always open. A few Polaroids fell out and my heart sank. One showed Greg with a part of his skull cracked open. He was jammed tight, sticking out of a freezer. The photo was labeled freeze tag in red writing. Another Polaroid was of the three people that went into Troy's house that dreadful night. One person was laying face first on the floor, bleeding out well. The other two were tied to chairs with gags in their mouths with hardly any clothing. They had this incredibly sad and awful look of fear and despair on their face. This one was labeled Musical Chairs. I looked at the final photo and my chest began to feel extremely heavy. My breath was becoming more shallow. I think I was having a panic attack. The photo was a shot of me from behind, most likely pretty recently. It read, Hide and Seek. What can I say now? My mother is sobbing in the room on the main floor, the room she had been sharing with my grandmother for the past few months. My grandmother's bed is empty, taken away from us, body and spirit. I'm at the dining room table studying the twisted black oak in the front yard. Its branches are empty, the leaves are still. It's a relief, I must admit, but still, there is a part of me. A desperate part that wishes she would appear. A figure in the branches, dressed in white. A vulgar smile on her lips. Not her smile. A friendly wave like leaves in the wind. I wouldn't be afraid now. I will never be afraid of anything again. My grandmother's name was Natalia, 
and she was 92 years old. An absolutely beautiful woman was my grandmother from scalp to soul, and mind to soul, inside and out. Together with my grandfather, she raised seven children, one of those being my mother. My grandfather was a working man, and I believe it's important to mention that he was also a very kind and sentimental man. But he wasn't much good at taking care of himself. So, to properly give credit where it's due, my grandmother took care of eight people while my grandfather supported them. They were by no means a rich family. In fact, a lot of them resided in a two-story apartment in a rather... not quite destitute, but close enough part of the city. My grandmother did not work a paying job, but she worked the family kitchen, tethered to the stove at all hours of the day. She was the kind of cook that wasn't aware of her gift. It was simply embedded in her, part of her nature, as easy and common to her as her smile, and just as winning. Cooking was an extension of her soul, so to became an ordinary part of her daily routine. The only part of her daily routine, really. And she did it selflessly. There was no desire on her part to be critiqued or to impress. She did not do it for herself. I don't think she even cared if her food tasted good. It just did. Always. Whether it was her cottage cheese and lasagna, everything she would serve would make you want to lick the plate clean and then kiss your fingers in gratitude. And there was no pride there either. None at all. For her, humility wasn't a practice but a precedent. All she wanted was to make sure that everybody, family, friend, or foe, had a full stomach at all times. That was her purpose in life. Her ritual. And so, it only made her happier when her seven children began to have children of their own. As the family grew, so did her smile. She was always the very first to arrive at every family gathering. Apron already wrapped around herself, the one with the brown flower petal design. And she would set the oven, ignite the burners, unstack the pots, rummage through the fridge to discover whatever spontaneous ingredients there was to find and get to work. She would run the tap and fill a sippy cup with water, and then hand it off to my little cousin Joyce. She'd send Joyce away to water the plants, because even plants needed to be fed. My mother and a few of my aunts had done a fantastic job in recreating certain dishes, but they were never quite the same. I regarded those dishes as honorable culinary past dishes, but my grandmother could have opened up a restaurant anywhere in the world and have made even the strictest of food critics shed a delighted tear. My favorite was her breaded shrimp. Those tiny, curled balls of shrimp, coated in breadcrumbs, and fried, or baked, or both, to perfection. They would appear on the table and get snatched up by greedy, gluttonous hands instantly, and subsequently tossed into drooling, open mouths like popcorn. The empty plate was often still hot as it was taken away and replaced by another, and so on. Seven years ago, my grandmother began to notice some odd behavior. By then, all of their children were in their 50s. Us grandchildren in our early to mid-20s. And it was just the two of them in that two-story apartment in that not-quite-destitute area of town. Both retired. My grandfather from work, my grandmother from seven children. There wasn't much for them to do. My grandfather mostly sat in front of the television watching soccer games, while my grandmother colored her thumbs green in the vegetable garden out back or slaved away at the stove, cooking for the sake of cooking, just in case someone stopped by, always prepared. My grandmother was not typically a woman of routine, but she would feed my grandfather a full meal three times a day, at the same times each day for 60 years. So, it was when she cooked him four meals one day that he lifted a curious eye. When she served him five meals the following week, that curiosity shifted to concern. 
Slowly she began to forget what day of the week it was. She would get lost in the garden. She would leave a burner on. She would forget that they ran out of breadcrumbs the day before. My grandfather could not cook. Nor could he clean a house, so when my grandmother's dementia started to become more and more apparent, the only sustainable solution was for one of their kids to move them into their home with them. It was time for the scales of life to rebalance themselves, for the child to give care to the parents. In the end, it was my mother that took them in. Divorced from my father a decade prior, and with both my older brother and myself having moved out not too long ago, my mother happened to be suffering from empty nest syndrome. A large suburban middle class home and only her. She took my grandparents in. My room became theirs. My brother's became the guest bedroom. The couch became my grandfather's permanent place of residence. My mother became my grandmother, tethered to the stove as she was. And my poor grandmother pupated inside a reverse chrysalis, each day hatching into a new place, a new mood, a new person. She was a child again, yet older than she had ever been. She forgot how to cook, and our palates grieved. We were all pretty shocked to see my grandfather pass away before her. It was last year that the cancer took him, and although the family opinion was split on the matter, my poor grandmother accompanied us to the open casket funeral, almost unbearable to watch. I witnessed my grandmother grapple with fresh, confused, newfound grief each time her eyes scanned the room and fell upon the body. Every minute and a half, she discovered that her husband had died. It got so intolerable that... We ended up turning her wheelchair away from the casket and kept her distracted from her surroundings for the remainder of the service. It wasn't long after this that she started seeing people in the trees. I was visiting my mother at her newer, yet older, house. She had sold the one I grew up in and downgraded to a bungalow with an added second floor. In that house, the dining room table faced a window. The television was showing us a documentary on the Elysia chlorotica, a slug that is able to survive through photosynthesis alone by stealing chloroplasts from the leaves they ate. We were all enjoying a pastiche dish that my mother prepared when my grandmother asked us why my grandfather was sitting in the tree. I gave my mother a sideways glance, and then looked up at the large, deformed black oak tree in the yard. It looked ominous in the dying light of the day, and its leaves quivered in a disquieting way, almost as if the tree acknowledged me and was waving hello. There was no one sitting in the tree, of course. My mother seemed to have not heard a word. She shoveled a fork full of pastiche into her mouth and stared at the wall. Mom? I said. She asked why Grandpa is sitting in the tree. That's weird, right? My mother waved a dismissive hand at me. She says stuff like that all the time. She hallucinates. Well, that's terrifying. I said. Why? She said. She sees your grandfather. It's probably his angel watching over us. I looked at her as if she were crazy. That doesn't creep you out? No, it's comforting. When I left that evening, I walked past the mangled black oak to get to my car. I stood below it for a moment, each obsidian limb reaching out from half a dozen elbows, its leaves fluttering in the breezeless night waving hello. That was the first time I saw what my grandmother saw. A man, no more than a silhouette, sat on one of the high branches, legs dangling and kicking at the air. He smiled down at me and his hand was raised, palm out, fluttering, quivering, disquieting my soul as it matched the movements of the leaves. I did not wave back. I looked away, walked as fast as I could on elastic legs and found my car. I managed to fit a shaking key into the ignition and made the engine come to life. The headlights brightened the road ahead, but the tree remained dark on the lawn. 
I turned my head reluctantly just to make sure I had truly seen what I thought I saw. Normally in stories like this, I would say that I saw nothing. That there was no man, that my imagination must have gotten the better of me. Except, this isn't a story like that. This is real life, and in real life, one's imagination isn't powerful enough to conjure up an image like that. And so I stared at the tree on the lawn, backlit by the orange glow of my mother's dining room window. A man high up in the branches stared back at me. His head was turned to a nearly impossible angle. His legs dangled and kicked, and he regarded me with a toothy smile, his hand dancing a greeting like the leaves. It was my grandfather, except it wasn't. It looked like him, but those teeth were not his. He never had teeth like that, not even with his dentures on later in his life. And the shape of the body, well, it wasn't quite right. It was my grandfather the way my mom's cooking was my grandma's. It was an honorable pastiche, but not quite the original. And then I jumped because someone else was waving at me from the glow of the window. It was my mother waving goodbye. A normal human wave. I waved back, hoping the thing in the tree wouldn't mistake my gesture as something meant for rent. I was afraid to interact with the thing in any way whatsoever, lest I invite it into my world, lest I open a formal line of communication. I decided it best to keep my eyes averted from that point on. I drove off into the bright lights of the city and climbed the stairwell to my apartment with haste, afraid of the echo of my own footsteps because it sounded like something was following me. In my bed, I stared silently out the window toward the scraggly maple tree across the street. It sat fully illuminated under a street lamp, and I could very plainly see that there was no humanoid sitting there. Regardless, I drew the blinds and felt better for it. A couple of weeks went by, and I had mostly gotten over the spookiness of what I had encountered at my mother's house. I was invited back over for lunch one afternoon. So I made my way to the suburbs and parked my car beside that haunted black oak. I stayed true to my promise and kept my eyes away. Head down, I marched right up the driveway to the front door and let myself into the house. Lunch was more of a parody than a pastiche this time. My mother looked tired, exhausted even. She looked old beyond her years. My grandmother asked her where my grandfather was, and my mother said that he was visiting his sister. Not a moment went by before my grandmother asked the same question. My mother began to cry. Mom? I can't do this. What's wrong? It's the same thing over and over. It never stops. What is that family doing in the tree? That was my grandmother. My skin turned cold. My mother's eyes widened and for a moment she looked genuinely afraid. Mom? I said. It's fine. She hallucinates. I craned my neck and stared out the gnarled black oak. Unmistakable in the piercing bright light of the day, there was, in fact, a family in the tree. Wearing only white, Two young boys sat on the lowest branch, smiling at us and waving their tiny, veiny hands. But no, they weren't quite veins. They were leafy venations, branching off of a midrib that ran from the middle of the wrist right up to the knuckle of the middle finger. Higher in the tree and standing were three middle-aged women and a young man, all of them wearing the same ivory attire all of them barefoot, all of them smiling detestable smiles, all of them waving. Each of their hands had those leafy veins, the motion of them like leaves in a soft wind. Higher still, sitting in the same position as before, was my grandfather. My grandmother giggled, her eyes affixed to the tree. What are they doing up there? She said and giggled again. She lifted her old, weak arm and waved at the family in the tree. 
My mother never looked once. Her eyes were glued to her plate, seemingly uninterested in her food, but even less interested in looking out the window. Mom? I began. Don't say it. She interrupted. A knock came at the door. My mother flinched and closed her eyes tight. I felt a finger trace its way down my spine, but it was really just a bead of sweat from my perspiring scalp succumbing to gravity. A few more fingers tickled my back before the knock came again. Who was at the door? My grandmother said, and tried to stand without her walker. My mother's eyes shot open, fear becoming concern. Ma, you can't. Sit down, you'll hurt yourself. I slowly rose to my feet. What are you doing? My mother asked me. I'm going to answer the door. There is no one at the door. Sit down. Mom, please believe me when I say this. There is no one there. Her eyes pleaded with me. I shook my head and went into the hallway. I heard her shout my name in protest, but I was already committed. I needed to at least look through the peephole. I needed to know if maybe it was just a normal person, a delivery man, or solicitor. I needed it to be a normal person or else I thought I would have lost a little bit of my mind, if I hadn't already. The hallway was dark despite the bright day. The windows around the door were opaque, so the small amount of light that found its way in was harshly diffused. I stood before it for a moment, afraid to go further. The knock came again, and I jumped from the sound. I almost lost my nerve, but I clenched my teeth and approached the door. I felt like I was in a state of fugue. Everything seemed animated and preternatural. The peephole watched me like the glistening eye of a predator. My mother's voice came to me from another dimension. It called my name like a question. My grandmother giggled somewhere far away. In a trance, I touched my forehead to the wood, placed my eye around the eye of the door, meeting my predator head on and looking into its soul. What I saw on the other side was not a person. What I saw on the other side was a beautiful day, an empty stoop, and a plate of shrimp. Another knock did not come. Still outside of myself, I slowly opened the door. I stared down at the plate incredulously, sweat still pooling at the nape of my neck and around my temples. The day was hot. The sun was bright. I was beginning to feel the oncoming of a headache. I reached up the plate in surprisingly steady hands. It was hot to the touch, although I wasn't quite sure if that was a product of the sun overhead, or if it was because it had come straight out of Hell's oven. Regardless, I brought it in and walked back to the dining room. Who is that? My grandmother asked my mother. That's your grandson. My mother told her. The son of who? The son of me. Your son? Yes, Mama. I haven't seen him since he was really little. Is he sleeping here? I put the plates on the table and reseated myself. You were right, I said. No one was there. My mother watched as I reached for a shrimp and placed it on my tongue. I thought one of your aunts had left it there the first time. She said, it was a lasagna. I chewed on something I hadn't tasted in years, at least not to that quality. It was my grandmother's breaded shrimp, authentically a matching signature. Do they know? I said, placing another shrimp into my mouth. The family? My mother nodded. They think it's a blessing. They think they're her guardian angels. And you? Serpents, she hissed. And you, my son, are eating the forbidden fruit. I swallowed another of those delicious shrimp and then wiped my hands on a napkin. I took my phone out of my pocket. 
I'm calling the police. No point. My mother's son. My grandmother asked where my grandfather was. My mother patiently told her that he was visiting his sister. What do you mean? I said. No one else can see them. Just our family. Then you're moving. They're in other trees wherever she goes. Who are those people? I asked, staring out at the family in the tree, seeing but not truly believing. The others, the kids. Your grandfather and his sister, sometimes his brothers, sometimes your grandmother's siblings. There are different people that come and go. I've matched them all to photographs. You told me it was his angel a few weeks ago. I believe that then. A few weeks is a long time. I looked away from the tree and met my mother's eyes. No, I said matter-of-factly. I don't believe it. We're suffering from some sort of group hysteria. This is not real, Mom. It's impossible. I read somewhere that in the Middle Ages an entire town started dancing together. 400 people, all of them dancing in a craze. They didn't stop for 30 days, some of them dancing themselves to literal death. They used to think that the devil possessed the town, but today we attribute it to severe stress. The bubonic plague was running rampant through Europe at the time, and people were experiencing a collective grief. They all just snapped a little bit. Grandpa died. Grandma requires your constant attention and care. All of you are constantly reminded of death because she asks about him every five minutes. So when she sees angels in the trees, so do you. My mother looked like she really wanted to believe me, but she spoke out loud the loophole that I was trying to suppress. Then why do you see it? And what is it you swallowed two minutes ago? I took a long drink of water. My hands no longer so steady. I burped and my mouth filled with the aftertaste of my grandmother's breaded shrimp. That night, I slept in the guest bedroom, not wanting to leave my mother alone after all that happened. My grandmother slept on the main floor, a convenient room because it had been a long time since she was able to march up the stairs. Lately, my mother slept in there with her in a portable bed on wheels adjacent to my grandmother's. Over the past few months, my grandmother's dementia had escalated substantially, no longer affecting just her past memory, but affecting her present reality. Her cognition was corroded and corrupt, and at night she would act out fever dreams, while being attacked by phantom pains. Once, my mother said, while she was complaining about how the mattress was breaking her spine, she suddenly said that she felt better after a shadow on the wall tipped its hat in her direction and sprinkled her with magnesium. Of course, the dementia was responsible for distorting her reality and all the wild things she saw or felt, for the most part, were no more than hallucinations. But now, my mother admitted, when it's well past midnight and Grandma tells me that Patrick is trying to get into the room, I half believe her. Who's Patrick? I had son. Patrick was my oldest sibling, a stillborn. The guest bedroom was on the upper floor, and to my immediate displeasure, I remembered that the window faced the lawn. The lawn with the tree, Without looking in that direction, I felt for the string and pulled the blinds. An hour later, I was wide awake, staring up at that old paint on the ceiling, letting the silence of the house and all its tiny sounds rinse over me like a slightly open tap. I heard the seldom sound of a car passing outside. I heard the low-frequency hum of the refrigerator downstairs. I heard the squawk of springs as my mother shifted in her portable bed. I heard the vague mutterings of my grandmother's voice, and the calming responses of my mother's. I heard a persistent tapping at my window. My heart stopped dead in my chest for a moment, and then sped up tenfold. 
There it was. A steady tick, 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 like the branch of a tree. Or a fingernail. Now it was heavier and less patient. A tack, tack, tack. All the saliva in my mouth vanished in an instant, and my teeth were clenched as if to hold in my breath, as if to not let a sound escape. My feet, sweating a moment ago in the humid heat of the summer, were cold, anxiety forcing my body to relocate the blood from my extremities to more useful parts of my body, like my rapidly beating heart, for instance. And then, clack, clack, clack. I jumped out of bed and hurried up to the far wall, where I stared at the window with wide, unhappy eyes. My mind was a mortified jumble of supplications, a silent prayer to the universe to make it all stop. When the doorbell rang, I heard my mother let out the most pathetic sound of despair I'd ever heard. A sound I would have made too, if I could have made a sound at all. More tapping at the windows, all around the house. A defeated, repeated set of no's from my mother downstairs, who was surely on the floor with nowhere to go. I had in my hand a fistful of my own hair. I tried telling myself that it was mass hysteria, that my brain was somehow overworked, or that I was suffering from some belated, unknown grief that I held locked away somewhere. The doorbell rang again, I swallowed my dry tongue, I chewed on my lips, I opened my mouth and shouted, What do you want? Go away from us. It was no use. The tapping continued and the doorbell was as unrelenting as my mother's sorry objections. But what really broke my heart was my grandmother's screams. The sound of her confused, agonized wailing was enough to level me out. I let go of my hair and strode to the window, more angry than afraid now. I lifted the blinds, prepared to confront the perpetrator of those perpetual taps, and immediately regretted it. I was greeted by the smiling face of a young man. It was only his face because he was holding himself up at the window sill. One veiny hand held the ledge of the window in a death grip, while the other tapped on the glass with inhuman speed. His eyes regarded me with joy, and he would never blink. I turned away and sleepwalked toward the door. As I reached for the knob, I heard the squeal of the window sliding open. Uncaring, now that I knew the world was chaos, I turned my head around in time to see a gangly arm reach into the room. Attached to that arm was a young man dressed in white, climbing blindly through the window. Wide, joyful eyes targeted on me, never leaving, never blinking. His smile widened when he saw that I had acknowledged him, and he waved at me. Meanwhile, my mother was sobbing, and my grandmother was shouting that she didn't feel well, that she needed to go to the hospital. All around, like a percussion band from the deepest depths of hell, came the constant rhythm of the window tappers accented every so often by the jangling ring of the doorbell. I turned away from the man crawling through the window and walked into the shadows of the hallway. As I walked toward the stairs, I remember thinking for a brief moment if perhaps hiding in the shadows on the wall was a man with a top hat, a man who might sprinkle magnesium into the mouth of the thing that was surely following me down the hall to enhance its toothy grin, to reinforce the bones there, to make them stronger. What did it eat to need such large chompers? Leafy greens, I thought, and let out a maniacal chuckle. I made my way down the stairs, and as I walked to the front door, I made sure to unlock every window I passed by. I just wanted the tapping to stop, so I let them in. When I arrived at the door, I did not look through the peephole, because I no longer cared about what I would find on the other side. Of course, when I turned the lock and pulled the door ajar, there was no one there. On the stoop in a round plate with a brown flower petal design around the rim was a penaton, my grandmother's famous penaton. 
with raisins and cranberries lodged in the dough like someone had used it for target practice with their dried fruit gun. Its shape was the telltale sign, slightly lopsided and resembling a large muffin. I stared down at it with impatience. Did you ring the doorbell? I asked it. It didn't respond. I left it there. Inside the house, a ceremony had begun. A crowd of figures in white surrounded my grandmother's bed. She was still crying, but softer now, less urgent. I glimpsed my mother on the floor and witnessed something spectacular. Despite all that was happening, my mother and my grandmother fell into the rehearsed rhythm of their everyday lives. First, my grandmother asked where her husband was. Then, like one of Pavlov's dogs, my mother said that he was at his sister's. My mother stared at the intruders with languished eyes. I casually walked in and lifted her to her feet. She asked me what was happening, and I shook my head in response. Together, with our arms around each other for comfort, we left the room and made our way to the couch. I sat her down and told her that it will all be okay. By now, I knew it would. By now I understood they were not here for us. They would not hurt us. Touch us. Moments later, my grandmother fell silent. One of the figures in white turned toward me. It was the man who had climbed through the bedroom window. His grin was the same. It had never faltered. He smiled happily at me while the others crouched toward my grandmother's bed and lifted her in their arms. But this one? He looked at me and he waved. Hello, 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 he said through his teeth. Will you come for me one day? I said to him. His mouth opened, his teeth unclenched. What came out was a laughter so absurd so hysterical that I had wished I were deaf. My mother blocked her ears and fresh tears dripped from her closed eyes. I took her hand and walked her outside to stand by the road, away from that horrible sound and those horrible people. It wasn't long before the succession pushed through the door. My deceased grandmother was their burden, but they all shared the weight. An awful sound of dissonance came from between their unwavering smiles. It took me a second to realize that they were singing. An elegy, perhaps, but there was no mark of lament on those happy faces. When they reached the tree, a few of the members broke off from the group and climbed the branches. The others lifted my grandmother's corpse, and the ones in the branches pulled her up and placed her gently in the tree. The one that was my grandfather climbed down from his perch near the top of the tree. I wanted to scream at him not to touch her. I wanted to protest against this grotesque sacrament, but I didn't. I watched with horrified eyes and held my mother fast while she wept. My grandfather, or rather the devilish pastiche of his likeness, wrapped himself around my grandmother and put his lips to hers. The kiss of life, the kiss of death. She sat up confused, but also not confused. She was confused the way a person is after coming out of a coma, but the dementia-related confusion was no longer in her stare. Her eyes finally found their way to my grandfather's uncanny face, and she beamed at him. She clawed at him and pulled him close. And then she saw the others and gathered them in around her. Her new family was found. And then, they were gone, just like that, vanished. After a while, I took my mother back into the house and she fell to her knees beside my grandmother's bed. The body was there, mouth slightly open. Her final breath lingered, perfuming the room with a smell like vinegar. When the ambulance arrived, the paramedics announced her death and the coroner removed the body for storage until my family could arrange with a funeral director. The next day, the family arrived, all of my mother's siblings, my brother, my cousins. Together we mourned and we planned the funeral, and we ate pastiche in celebration of a life that was lost. 
a life we held dear to us. The Panettone was given to the coroner as a thank you for his grim work, but there were still desserts like cannolis and biscottis and apple crisp and best of all, grappa, which I had the most of. The day after that, I stayed to console my mother and to keep her company. I took the week off work with the excuse of bereavement, so I decided that I would stay here with her. We experienced something together, something that forever would separate us from everyone else in our family. We needed each other to recover from that, but I don't think we ever will. Whatever it was that happened defied all logic. The world as I thought I knew it has become as lopsided as my grandmother's famous Panettone. All I could hope for is for time to heal me, to maybe one day think back without clarity. Maybe dementia would make me forget, or maybe it would just bring them back. I walked for miles yesterday to try to clear my head, and I came across a salt marsh. It was beautiful and sad. And when I finally looked away, I saw something on my shoe. A leaf, I thought at first, but it was moving. Crawling. It was a rare species of slug called Elysia chlorotica. I had seen a documentary on them. They looked exactly like a leaf, and they can survive for weeks off the chloroplasts from the leaves they ate through photosynthesis alone. Big jumpers, I thought leafy greens. But what can I say now? My mother is sobbing in the room on the main floor, the room she had been sharing with my grandmother for the past few months. My grandmother's bed is empty, taken away from us, body and spirit. I'm at the dining room table studying the twisted black oak in the front yard. Its branches are empty. The leaves are still. It's a relief, I must admit. But still, there is a part of me, a desperate part that wishes she would appear, a figure in the branches dressed in white, a vulgar smile on her lips, not her smile, a friendly wave like leaves in the wind. I wouldn't be afraid now. I will never be afraid of anything again. As a child, I loved digging holes. I never expected to find anything at the bottom of them. I just loved the act of shoveling dirt and making a hole out of the flat ground. Behind my house, there were several acres of dense woods that were perfect for it. My friend William and I would each take a large stick and hack a trail through the overgrowth of milkweed and thistles that covered the edge of the woods. Once we found a clearing, we'd bury your shovels into the ground and begin piling the crummy soil up around the hole's perimeter. We had built one hole that was significantly larger than the rest. The top of it was covered with tree branches so we could crawl through a small opening and use it as an underground fort. Early one summer morning, we ran out to the woods to build an addition to the fort. There was a large tree just outside the hole on the side that was opposite the entrance. Our plan was to make a lean-to up against the tree and expand the hole so that we could go in the entrance and come back above ground inside the lean-to. It took most of the afternoon, but we finally finished. It was mostly dark inside the lean-to except for a few small cracks of light that came through the roof and William's green and black sneakers that glowed in the dark. As we walked around the outside and admired the day's work, I heard something that sounded like a mumbling voice from back in the woods. What was that? Did you hear that noise? I whispered. William just laughed. You always hear things out here, and there is never anything. It was probably just the wind. But there was only a slight breeze. And since William's overly loud laugh, the forest had become dead silent. I don't know whether it was the silence or the forest getting darker. But something about the woods that night filled me with terror. I sprinted down our path as fast as I could and didn't look back. I could hear William yelling, Chicken and Scaredy Cat, but in that moment I didn't care. The canopy of trees was blocking most of the sun from reaching the forest floor and the darkness only amplified my fear. 
Finally, I could see the entrance of the woods up ahead and my house in the distance. I pushed myself even harder, pumping my scrawny nine-year-old legs for all they were worth. I burst out into the open, but I didn't stop until I reached my back door. It was only once I was inside that I realized how scratched up my legs were from running through the thistle. When I caught my breath, I started to feel a little foolish. I did tend to be a little jumpy, and I didn't see anything in the woods. There was no way William was going to let up on teasing me about my cowardice, even though the voice had sounded very real and fairly close. It was much easier to doubt myself when I was standing safely inside my house. Later that night after dinner, I told my parents I'd left something outside and I needed to run and get it. I made my mind up that I was going back in the woods to prove to myself that I wasn't scared. Whatever I thought I heard couldn't have been real. I grabbed a flashlight and briskly jogged to the entrance of the forest. The sun had almost set and it was difficult to see very far through the thick foliage. I crept down the path, careful to make as little noise as possible. When I reached the clearing, the lean-to was knocked down and the branches over the fort had caved in, and were now mostly covered by dirt. I didn't know whether William had trashed it out of anger, or some older kids had wrecked it, but seeing my favorite hideout trashed made me forget about where I was and how late it was. I set down my flashlight, and slowly began pulling the tree branches out of the hole. Once I'd removed all the branches from the cave-in, I went to clear out all the dirt that had been thrown into the hole, but when I picked up my shovel, the dirt on the end of it was still soft and wet. Whoever had wrecked our hideout had done it recently. My one-track mind was so focused on repairing my fort that I didn't stop to think about all the danger I could be in. I had only dug a few shovelfuls when I hit something hard in the midst of all the loose dirt. It was difficult to see what it was since my flashlight was laying outside of the hole. I only had to brush a small amount of soil away before I saw something familiar glowing underneath a thin veneer of dirt. All that was visible was a small part of William's luminescent sneakers, and an inch of his pale skin just above his socks. Fear seized every part of my body. I was kneeling in the bottom of a dark hole in the middle of the woods next to a lifeless body, and something or someone was still lurking nearby. Finally, I was able to come to my senses enough to reach up and turn off the flashlight. I slowly crawled out of the hole and laid completely still, listening for anyone that was prowling nearby. I crept slowly through the dark. By now, most of the trail had been flattened enough to make the path fairly obvious. I was walking as quietly as I could, slightly bent over to keep myself as invisible as possible. Once I was about halfway out of the woods, the path straightened out so there was no longer any danger of losing my way. I slowly let out an audible breath of relief as my porch lights came into view off in the distance. I was preparing to sprint for home when a light from behind me scanned the trees above. Don't forget your flashlight. A loud voice half shouted and half grumbled. As I dashed for home, I could hear the most sickening laugh ringing through the woods. By the time I reached home, my shirt was stained with dirt and tears. It took several moments before my parents could understand me through my incoherent sobbing. When the police searched the woods that night, they were able to find a small abandoned encampment just a hundred yards beyond our fort. It was littered with refuse and notebooks filled with half-crazed ramblings. They never were able to find William's killer, but some nights when my room is especially dark, I can still hear him laughing. I met my husband eight years ago in our junior year of college. He always tells our friends it was love at first sight, despite the fact that he couldn't see my face during our first interaction. We got locked in a basement at a frat party. It was dim and he didn't have his glasses with him. 
I remember seeing him around campus, and I always thought he looked silly with them. The lenses were so thick, they made his eyes as big as saucers. That was one of the first things I noticed about him. He spent the majority of our time in the basement with his eyes squinted. He said it hurt his head when he didn't have them. We were stuck down there for a few hours. One of his friends came looking for him, and we got out. He ran up to his bedroom asking me to stay put. He returned with his glasses, finally taking a good look at me in the light. He told me he thought I was a girl with a cold based on my voice, but I clearly made quite the impression on him as he asked to hang out more often. After about a year of being friends and spending the majority of my time at a frat house, or with my horrible roommate, I decided to move off campus. I asked him to move with me. We were best friends and we needed to focus on getting our lives together in a less distracting environment. He agreed. We were both excited to start building our lives side by side. I loved spending time with him. Watching him fall in love with me at the same time I did was one of the greatest things in life. He kissed me in front of everyone on our graduation day. My heart practically jumped out of my chest when it happened. Not that I didn't want to kiss him. I just never expected that he'd make the first move in front of all of his friends and family. He pulled away, slapping a hand across his mouth in shock at his decision. We laughed about it. He lost a few of his frat friends after that. But the majority of people we knew were accepting of our new relationship. We continued living together in the city until our engagement. A lot of dark stuff happened between then. He got a job at a slaughterhouse as a janitor of sorts. This caused a lot of arguments between us. I thought it to be cruel. The job eventually became too much. He was one to wear his heart on his sleeve. I could always read his expressions better than he knew. He came home one day looking tense. As his partner, I offered to help him relax, which led to him running away and puking up his stomach into the sink. He saw some stuff happen at work. He walked in on a man who he worked with violating one of the cows. It freaked him out enough to talk to his boss and ask if there were any alternative positions he could take. One that didn't include blood and guts. His boss sent us out to a small farm in the countryside. It was a big change as neither of us had experienced country living, but it looked good financially. We'd get to live on the property for free. He'd get paid by the hour, and all he really had to do was look after a couple of animals. He proposed to me before our move. We had a quiet wedding in the city, and started our new life in the country as newlyweds. Things were really good for a while. I'd started work from home as a graphic designer, and he took care of the farm. There was only one negative. The wheat field. It freaked me out when we first arrived. It was tall, taller than me and my husband, and it stretched out for miles. I had a previous traumatic experience in a cornfield when I was in college. I accepted a drink from a friend that was laced with a psychedelic and got lost in it. Things weren't the same for me mentally after that. It was one of the dark points I mentioned earlier on. I spent a while trying to recover from the whole situation, my husband by my side every step of the way. I did eventually, but the backyard of my new home was something that sent a chill down my spine. I put it behind me choosing to focus on my art and husband. I decorated the house, started a garden, took up yoga and crystals. My husband didn't suspect my disdain to the surroundings of our home. I knew that if he did, we'd move back to the city in a second. We had neighbors, two brothers who lived about a half mile down the road from us. They said they only stayed for three months out of the year as a trip in memory of their late parents. I became friends with one of them. He was spiritual, peace, and love type of guy. The other was ADHD personified. He and my husband got along quite well. They had the same interests in numbers and statistics. They became good friends in an incredibly short amount of time. 
The last time I saw my husband was a week ago. He got home from the small town we went grocery shopping in. He walked in with mud on his knees and elbows. I laughed a bit at his appearance. He tried to mess around and hug me, explaining as he chased me around the house that he slipped on his way up the driveway. He kept stumbling as he didn't have his glasses on. I didn't think anything of it. After a few minutes of trying to be funny, he said he was going to go shower. He tripped on his way up the stairs, getting mud on a few of them. By the time he was done showering, the sun was down. He called me from upstairs, asking if his glasses were in our bedroom or on the counter. I checked and couldn't find them anywhere. He said he thinks they might have still been outside from when he fell. I offered to go out and help him look, but he was a kind man. He didn't want me out in the cold or to get dirty. He knew I had a fear of being outside in the dark as well. I curled up on our couch while he walked out of the light of our porch. I could see his flashlight moving around from my peripheral vision for a bit. I worked on a piece on my iPad. The customer needed it done by the morning, and I was so focused on getting the details figured out that I didn't even notice the time passing. I wish more than anything that I just went outside with him. I finished up the piece. The house seemed too quiet. I checked the time. He'd went outside an hour ago to find his glasses. He wasn't back. I stood up, looking out the window. I stepped outside and called his name. I got nothing but an echo and the sounds of grasshoppers in return. I closed the door, creeping up the stairs to our bedroom and bathroom. Not there. I don't know if this will make you guys think I'm horrible. If it does, I understand. I don't think I'll ever forgive myself for how things went that night. Maybe it was shock or fear. Or maybe it was irrational and I'm truly vile, but I went upstairs to my bedroom and laid in bed. I remember thinking to myself that I shouldn't worry. That he'd be back any second. I shouldn't go outside and look for him because he was okay. He was just taking a while to find his glasses. I couldn't sleep that night. The air was still in the house and I'd felt more vulnerable than ever before. Like the sides of my body were exposed to a crowd of people. Any sound I heard felt like I got lifted higher on a crucifix. Spread out and unable to defend myself from the unknown. I don't know when I fell asleep, but as soon as daylight showed, I went outside and searched everything. I went to the neighbor's house. I explained to them what happened. Still in a bit of daze. We went to the police station where they told us there wasn't anything they could do for the next 48 hours. We spent all day looking around town. The grocery store, the library, everywhere. I called hospitals in the area, talked to gas station clerks nothing. I got back home later in the day, checked the house and farm again. My friends offered to stay overnight, to which I said yes. I went up to my bedroom at 9 p.m. My friends were in our guest room, which brought me some comfort. I was woken up at 2 a.m. by some strong winds. I heard a rattling come from the backyard. I stood up and looked out the window trying to avoid eye contact with the wheat field as best I could. There was little to no way to see. The only light source came from the chicken coop. Despite my best efforts, my eyes traveled to the field. I noticed movement in the plants coming from a while away. It moved closer and closer to the edge of the field. By that point, I was trembling. My heartbeat pounded hard enough to make me feel sick. I couldn't see whatever it was that was causing the movement. By the time it got close enough for me to make out, I turned away, squeezing my eyes shut and putting my hands over my head. I was so afraid. I felt myself begin to unravel. I needed my husband back. One of my friends had to work at 6 a.m. I walked downstairs to say goodbye, thank them for everything they'd done to help. They left at 5.30. I couldn't go back to sleep, still feeling a sense of shock at the fact that my husband was gone, and I had no clue what happened. 
I made some coffee and slowly walked back upstairs. I took a second to crouch down on the stairs, lightly touching the mud prints from the last time I really saw my husband. I heard a sound coming from the bedroom. I slowly stood back up, trying to tiptoe to the source. I made it to the crack in our bedroom door. I saw my husband inside. As much as I wanted to run in and hug him, a piece of me told me to stay put. I watched him for a second, letting my eyes adjust to what I was truly seeing. He was nude. His spine seemed to be severely curved to the left, the line of his back going deep and crooked. He was hunched over, his arms dangled at his sides as if he was not feeling in them. They were long, it looked like his shoulders were dislocated. The skin on his neck to his shoulders stretched unnaturally. His knees were bowed inwards. I watched as he took a shaky step toward the window. His feet dragged and his knees wobbled, almost like a fawn taking its first steps. Everything about the scene was uncanny. I could make out his side profile. His jaw was slack, his eyelids hung low, his eyes expressionless. I slowly backed away, walking downstairs to the living room. I waited for him to come down, to tell me he hurt himself. That's why he looked so odd. Or to tell me he was lost in the fields. That's why he appeared so gaunt. I placed my coffee cup down with force. I wanted to make a noise. I wanted it to know that I was in the house, to hide or run away if it needed. I knew immediately that I was afraid of it, even if it looked like my husband. An hour passed. I could hear heavy footsteps upstairs. They lightened over time. My blood ran cold at the fast-paced footsteps I heard coming down the stairs. I clenched my fists. I asked for forgiveness subconsciously. I don't know what I expected. My husband walked into the kitchen. Dressed, showered, and walking normally. He smiled upon seeing me, asking why there was mud all over the steps. I laughed, still sitting at the counter. He didn't question my lack of response to his disappearance. He walked past me, planting a kiss on my cheek and reaching for the box of cereal in the cupboard. I noticed what looked to be stretch marks up his arm. I didn't know what to say. My lips quivered. I had little to no control of my facial expressions. As much as I felt the situation wasn't normal, I couldn't help myself from standing up and wrapping my arms around him. He hugged me back, rubbing my head and planting another kiss to my cheek. I let out a quiet sob, gripping him tighter, desperately waiting to feel a connection with him. I thought that the closer I was to him physically in that moment, the more likely I would be to shake the ugly feeling I had about him. I peeled myself away from him, grabbing his face in my hands and looking into his eyes. I couldn't see anything in them. No emotion. He had a smile on his face. It looked like nothing I'd seen from him before. I told him I had to go to work. He nodded and kissed me goodbye. I got in the car and drove to my friends down the road. Only one of them was home. I knocked and started to explain what was happening as soon as he'd opened the door. He looked at me like I was crazy because who could be afraid of their own husband who was missing only 24 hours ago? I stayed at his house for the next few hours. He tried to help me rationalize what I thought I saw, but in the end he really didn't have anything to explain the behavior. I asked him to come home with me, see for himself. The car ride to my house was silent. My anxiety as we got closer was evident. We pulled up, going inside to find my husband on the couch going through the camera roll on his phone. He watched videos of us. He laughed at the same time as he did in the video. I announced my presence. He turned his head practically all the way around to the front door, smiling when he saw us. It looked different from the smile earlier. His gums showed and his eyes scrunched up with his lips. 
He laughed, identical to the laugh we'd just heard from him rehearsing. I didn't hear you come in. All three of us sat in the living room for a bit, acting as though everything was normal. My friend watched videos on his phone. He scrolled onto one, a math question that apparently only one out of 100 people could solve. He looked up expectantly at my husband raising his eyebrows as a way to ask if he could solve it. My husband, who knew everything, to be the smartest person they'd met, who graduated with a degree in mathematics and statistics, looked at him, shrugging his shoulders, letting out a chuckle that seemed too artificial. That was just the first day back. The next day was still strange. I still hadn't asked him any questions. He hadn't brought it up at all. I noticed that he didn't bring anything up himself. He wouldn't speak unless I spoke to him first. He barely ate anything. He hadn't gone out to check the animals or clean up. Nothing. The third day he left for five hours. He walked outside. He went into the wheat field. I watched him and did nothing to stop him. He came back later as if nothing happened. The fourth day, my friends came over again, watching him in confusion. My husband didn't notice their questioning faces. The fifth day, I went to my friend's house again. Only one of them answered the door. He said his brother hadn't come home that night. Yesterday night, my husband went into the wheat fields again. We watched him return from the guest room window. He had blood dripping down his shirt. Chunks of what seemed to be flesh clung onto his mouth and hands. He looked around skittishly, like an animal hoping to not be caught doing something bad. He came in through the back door, hurriedly running up to our bathroom. I heard the shower start. I listened from the guest room. Tears ran down my face. I realized that my husband was gone. Thirty minutes ago... I walked by the bathroom and watched him through the door he left slightly open. He grabbed the corners of his mouth, stretching each end up to his ears, the skin ripping slightly. He dragged his hands over his eyes, the skin underneath them molding with his fingers like clay. He put his hand in his mouth, his thumb resting on his chin, the other hand opposite. The fingers pressed against the roof of his mouth. He pulled, dragging his jaw open at least 12 inches. There was a tearing sound like the nerves in his face were snapping. His bones popped. Saliva poured out into the sink. He placed his hands on the counter and watched himself in the mirror. He was sad. I think I'm going to kill him today. There is a consistent sense of guilt I have. I let my husband be replaced by whatever this thing is. A part of me hopes he's still out there. I can't let him be replaced by this replica. I won't let the man I love be immortalized this way. I can't. Wish me luck. Okay, so I have limited knowledge on technology, but this forum looks promising. I can see from the name that you all struggle with sleep, and well, I am in the same miserable boat. As the title says, if I don't go to sleep tonight, I will die. And yes, that sounds very dramatic, right? Maybe you're wanting to skip down to the bottom of this post and comment. Just go to bed then, easy. But before you grace me with that clever piece of advice, listen, I can't. There is not a simple case of next day jitters keeping me from going to sleep. This isn't the fault of my overactive mind asking inane questions, or replaying my most embarrassing moments over and over like a greatest hits reel. No, I wish it was just that. I wish I could tell you that this was just a particularly bad case of the regular brand of human insomnia, but it's worse. I physically cannot sleep. 
I've tried everything from drugs to knocking myself out. None of it is working. My body is incapable of the type of sleep it needs and, apparently, we're just now learning how vital that is to my survival. It sucks. Majorly. Anyway, trying to get away from all the bleak imminent death stuff? Dr. Pym once told me that. The internet knows everything. So, here I am, internet. Asking you to please tell me. Is there a way to force your body to go to sleep within 24 hours? Surely at least one of you here has a surefire fall asleep method. Maybe even something so simple that myself or the doctors have completely ignored. Is that too hopeful? Probably. I understand that it's a long shot, especially since my body, and therefore its processes, are different from yours, but I have to try. Well, I guess I should explain the situation a bit, huh? Just realize I'm this far into the post and I haven't even introduced myself. Isn't there a human thing where you're more likely to care about something after it has a name? Or is that only if you are the one to name it? Either way, let me introduce myself. My name is Three, and I'm one of the Myriad. Not that that even means anything to you. You're a civilian. I hope. It'd blow if I went through all this trouble to sneak onto the internet, just to immediately get caught. Well caught before I can even get some advice. If you know about me, you know what's happening to me. I know someone will find this, but please. Odds are, it'll be sooner rather than later, but come on. No one can really be mad at me or one, right? Everyone knows I won't last much longer. I don't think any of you even managed to look me in the eyes today. Not even Dr. Pym. I guess what I'm trying to say is, can you really blame me for trying to reach out? I could have emailed a news station, I could be sending out pictures, or releasing the files on this phone to the public. I'm really not trying to hurt Operation Myriad. It'd kill me if something happened to one or two. I just, I'm trying to get some help. Please don't be too mad at us. I know you'll believe me when I say, all of this was my idea in the first place. I guess with that out of the way, I should warn you. I've had typing lessons, but I've never actually used a phone keyboard. Dr. Pym has allowed me to watch TikTok videos and play some games on his phone while running tests on my siblings before, especially on days when I was unable to participate in the tests, but I was explicitly forbidden from trying to message anyone on it. Didn't stop me from disobeying, from looking through his pictures or conversations with the three people he texts, but it was a pretty toothless act of rebellion. Then, about a month ago, I sneezed and, well, I melted his phone in acid. He got a new one, but I kind of felt too guilty to play with it anymore. Still, I guess that didn't stop me from stealing it today. At least no way I can melt this one. Where am I going with this, you might be asking. The answer is... I don't know. I think I was going to apologize for typos, or something like that, because this phone keyboard feels infinitely smaller than a real one, but really? I should probably apologize for my rambling. It's been four days since I last slept, and yeah, sleep deprivation is definitely affecting me less than it should. Less than it would affect a normal human, but I still feel... vague. Not all the way there. Sometimes my mind still feels normal. Sharp. But then it feels like I'm wading through a mist. Just looking for the point in what I'm doing. Anyway, point found. Forgive me for typos and rambling. Please just read with an open mind and then give me your best advice on how to deal with the situation. Keeping things short, we, the Myriad, are the products of a government experiment that took place 16 years ago. 25 human embryos were injected with a synthesized genetic material derived from an alien wreckage. Of those 25, only three of us came to term. 
We were named after our experiment, Project Myriad. We live in a compound, a sterile white building, where a team of scientists watch our every move. This probably sounds pretty horrible, huh? Maybe a little like a violation of human rights, and yeah, it would be. If we were human, but as it stands, it is probably not safe for us, nor for humanity, for the myriad to leave the compound and try to live normal lives. The reason being... In the womb, our genetic code was completely rewritten. The alien genes attach themselves in a way that Dr. Pym still says is impossible. I'm not sure how to explain exactly how or what happened, even before the sleep stuff started. I wasn't exactly good with science, but I want to describe the situation with as much detail as possible on the off chance that it could help solve the problem. I wish two was here. He would be better at explaining it than me, but he once used an analogy that even I could understand. Do you know about cowbirds? Brown birds that lay white, speckled eggs? Well, what's interesting about them, other than their weird name, is that they have a very peculiar parenting method. That method being that they don't raise their children at all. Cowbirds lay their eggs very quickly into the nests of other birds. Now, if you think the parental abandonment is bad, know that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Which is what happens to the unwilling host's hatchlings. They fall far from the tree. I could have worded that better. What I'm trying to say is that cute, little freshly hatched cowbirds enter the world and often immediately choose violence. They get rid of their siblings and then receive all of the nourishment from their host parents. It's pretty messed up. So this is related to me and my siblings, not in the fact that we were going to kill each other or human children. We're not evil or trying to kill humanity or anything like that. Nothing like the weirdo cowbirds. Though I guess our names are weird. So we're alike in one way. Sorry, I lost my point again for a second. What I'm trying to say is, the alien material that we were subjected to, that's what did the cowbird thing. It ripped away the part of our DNA that would have been passed down from our human father, and bonded with that of our birth mother. And yes, if you're particularly keen-eyed, I said mother rather than mothers in relation to myself and my siblings. That is singular on purpose, not a typo. I said earlier that there were 25 embryos injected, and only three of us came to term, but I guess... Technically, only one of the original 25 came to term. A lot of our past is shrouded in secrecy, even from us. Some things we've been told, other things we were able to conclude through observation and eavesdropping. The original plan was, most likely, for the team that was assigned to us, top scientists from every field, high-ranking military personnel, and of course those with lots of money and special interest, to keep us completely in the dark about what we were, how we came to be. It's safe to say that, in the beginning at least, the plan was to raise us in a sort of cold, detached way. But... That didn't work out. To keep us a secret, the same small group of people have been with us since birth. They practically are as confined to the compound as we are. Whether they meant for it to happen or not, we've become something of a family, and while most of what I know about regular human families comes from Pym, and what the television has showed me, I think we're fairly normal in the sense that it's us, the youngest of the family, that everyone revolves around. It was too hard for them to keep everything a secret from us. Of course, it is hard to keep a secret from two anyway. Back to the myriad. We are identical as, apparently, we split once and then once again, which should be impossible. They don't know why our mother was the only one who was able to produce a viable child. But Dr. Pym once told us she was the earliest along in terms of her pregnancy. Other than that, we don't have much information about her. 
I'm not even sure if she's alive or not, as we've never met her. Anyway, whoever she was or is, I find myself thinking about her a lot. I think I would have liked to met her to see what it's like to have an actual parent. There's Pim and the general, but what would it be like to have a mom? This is probably a pretty stupid thing to be thinking about so close to the end. Anyway, I don't know if any of that is helpful, but now you know I'm, biologically speaking, half human. So at least half of your fall asleep advice should be effective, right? I guess I should tell you a little bit more about my alien side now. Hopefully I have time. I can hear one tapping on the metal door. Pretty soon it'll be time for dinner, and if I don't show up, that'd cause a problem. I'll try to keep this short, to the point. <laughs> that hasn't worked well so far. Okay, so remember how I said the alien material was unstable? That's because its genetic code was constantly rewriting itself. It made it incredibly difficult to study, apparently. I don't know why they decided to try to bond it with human DNA. I remember Dr. Pym once told me they tried a similar experiment but with orangutan sperm and human eggs, so I guess it's just a human thing to try to make babies with whatever you can. Well, whatever the thought was originally, it resulted in me and my siblings, so thanks humanity. Thanks for being weird. Anyway, our DNA is far more stable and fixed than that of the aliens. Dr. Pym has a theory that they were most likely able to shapeshift at will. But that isn't usually within our capabilities. I'll come back to the usually in a moment, but do we shapeshift? Yeah, in a way. It's just not something that we have any control of. Trying to keep it as simple as possible, each time we go to sleep, as our bodies enter REM, our genetic code completely rewrites itself. We wake up from the cold cots of the compound looking entirely different each morning. Height and weight, race and gender, it varies from day to day. More than that, each day we develop a different power. I know that sounds vague, but let me try to clarify. 1. She predominantly reawakens as a female. And even if she doesn't, she still identifies as she slash her. One typically has powers that control or emit a physical phenomena, i.e. laser eyes, pyrokinesis, and super strength. She's the only one of us who has ever been able to shapeshift with complete control at will. That's why I said usually earlier. Two is different. His powers aren't nearly as flashy as ones often are but they usually have to do with his inner mind. He often has telekinesis, mind control, and foresight. It's the reason why it's about impossible to keep a secret from him. Thankfully, today he has psychometry. I learned something recently, something that I'm not exactly eager to share. Not that Two is even paying any attention to me right now. Well, you already know me. I'm three, and if you can't tell, I'm the oddball of the group. I mentioned earlier about accidentally melting Dr. Pym's phone with acid snot. Yeah, my powers are almost always useless and only ever seem to affect me. Once I woke up with the ability to grow my nails long, another time I was given an extra row of eyelashes, and on another memorable occasion, I woke up and my only ability was to lie. Like I was physically unable to tell the truth that day. That day sucked majorly. I made one cry big, ugly tears. Two seemed to nearly hate me. Dr. Pym looked at me with this face I'd never seen before. His mouth was drawn into a thin, tight line, and his eyes were narrowed somewhere between disgust and disappointment. Eventually the doctors figured out about the lying thing, but... That day was a particularly painful one. But now, lying day is no longer at the top of my sucky powers list. One has dubbed my current ability, insomnia. The reason being that I am now completely unable to sleep. Without being able to enter REM, my body isn't changing anymore. 
I feel like I'm going crazy and the scientists at the compound are saying that my unstable DNA is breaking down. They aren't sure how I'm even standing anymore as every piece of me is rapidly collapsing on a molecular level. I'm really scared. I really don't want to die. The only time I've ever been out of the compound was three years ago. Dr. Pym got permission to take us to a rented out ice cream parlor for our birthday. We were escorted by a SWAT team and weren't even allowed to go to the restroom at the shop. But it was still so fun. So different. I don't want to die with that being my only story outside this place. Nor my siblings. Two has completely distanced himself from me. He won't look at me. All he does is spend his days in the lab, analyzing my blood samples that are taken day after day. Now, hour after hour, even my older skin and blood samples, the ones taken before this power ever cursed me are breaking down. I can't read minds, but I can feel Two's sense of panic. If his appearance wasn't changing, I'd think he's getting less sleep than I am. One is, as usual, trying to keep positive. She's the one that tried knocking me out. My chin is still bruised, but nothing's working. Stealing Pim's phone, posting this for help. It was all my idea, but she's helped me. I feel so weak. I probably wouldn't have been able to make it up the steps without her. I haven't told either of them yet about what I overheard. Early this morning before the sun had even begun to rise, I was watching reruns of George Lopez, the only thing that was really on TV at the time. Looking over every now and then as my siblings slowly changed form, and I thought that I would be okay with dying. I tried to tell myself it was okay. I even thought, better me than them. Not just because I love one and two, not because it would break me if I lost either of them, but for the obvious reason. Compared to them, I'm pretty useless. It seemed right that I would die. By the time they were fully different, I thought I'd made peace with myself. Maybe that had been a lie all along. I'd just been shoving my regrets and fears down enough to delude myself, but either way, things quickly changed. I decided since it was most likely my last sunrise, I wanted to watch it. It's summertime, but desert nights are chilly even in July. I bundled up, wrapping the blanket around me, and started to drag myself up the stairs to the roof. My chest hurt after just one floor, and I sat down to rest. I felt so tired, but as you know, couldn't sleep. After resting... I forced myself to climb up the second set of stairs, almost halfway to my goal. At the landing, I could hear voices, arguing voices. I almost opened the door, but then I heard Dr. Pym. You don't know that they won't die too. And I froze. That's how we found the aliens. Only one had been killed on impact. The other two died after. I kept listening, and I learned about something they'd never told us. In fact, they had lied to us. The spaceship that had crash-landed here, the one that they said was a flaming pit, that they had to synthesize genetic material from the wreckage because there just wasn't anything left, that was a lie. There were three aliens. One died from the crash, and the other two survived. The government took them, probably planning to experiment on them, but they deteriorated before they even made it through transport. Luckily, the scientists managed to preserve just a small part of them, the part that would become myself and my siblings. But the cause of death for the two aliens that survived the impact was never determined. Apparently, Dr. Pym had a theory. He thought that the three were connected, that they could have been like us, three that split from one, and that in order for us to continue on, all of us had to survive. He sounded so sure. They were arguing back and forth. Apparently one and two were also showing signs of genetic deterioration, albeit much less than me, but this was the first I've heard of it. 
Additionally, their reformations were taking longer, admittedly. Before, I had never actually witnessed it happen, so I had no frame of reference for how fast the process was supposed to be. But they talked like it was previously done in an instant. I thought back to that morning, to my siblings changing over the course of two or three George Lopez episodes. One skin going from paper white to a freckled sand color. Two's black hair morphing into curly strands of blonde. Had it taken longer than it had yesterday. I wasn't sure. I'm still not sure. I heard a door slam, followed by heavy footsteps. They never reached a conclusion. They never agreed nor disagreed on whether or not my stupid power was killing not only me, but my siblings. I didn't know I was crying until I heard myself hiccup a sob. Three? And then Pim was there. The circles under his eyes looked even darker than mine. I tried to stand up to get away, but I ended up falling. My chin hit the ground and the bruise one had given me ached. How much did you hear? I couldn't lie. All of it. He took off his glasses and wiped his hand over his face. Sweat poured off his forehead. I wondered how long they'd been arguing for. If they die, it'd be my fault, wouldn't it? And immediately he started saying no, trying to reassure me, but it felt like a lie. After that, Dr. Pym begged me to not tell my siblings. That they didn't even know for sure what had happened to the three aliens that were effectively our biological father. But he looked sure. He looked as sure as he sounded mere minutes ago. Still, I promised him I wouldn't tell. The reason is selfish. Two's already pushing me away. Maybe he knows that it's my fault he and one are going to die, but one? She's never been anything but smiles. If she were to be mad at me... I think it'd be like dying twice. I don't want either of them to have to spend their last days like I currently am. Knowing what's coming, knowing how little of the world we've seen, knowing that we've done nothing. So instead of telling them, I'm telling you. And I'm hoping against all laws that these don't have to be our final days. One of you out there, on the internet, the place Dr. Pym says knows everything, can you help me? Help us? Tell me, no matter how stupid you think it is, how I can get to sleep tonight? It's time for me to go now. Dinner time, but until Pim notices I've stolen his phone. Or until my hand's too weak to hold it. Whichever first. I'll keep checking here. Waiting for your advice. I was watching a show at 3 in the morning when the ad break began. I sat with glazed eyes through a Geico commercial and one promoting a new drink, but when the third one began, it immediately caught my attention. 254 Helton Street. The shout nearly blew out the speakers of my phone. Lurching upright in my bed, I held down the volume button until it was nearly muted. The set of the advertisement was a simple plastic table in a small room painted the same shade of light gray over walls, floor, and ceiling. A man sat at a folding chair behind the table, dressed in a worn bathrobe. I could make out several coffee stains down the front. The man had uneven stubble poking out across his face, and heavy bags drawn under his eyes. His most striking feature, however, was how crushingly sad he looked. His expression reminded me of my father's when we attended his mother's funeral. Broken, hopeless, and uncertain. He suddenly opened his mouth fully and screamed again. 254 Helton Street. Despite the energy behind the shout, his expression didn't change in the slightest, and he went back to staring directly at the camera. I looked at the top corner of my phone to see how much longer this would go on for, but the usual countdown had disappeared. Frowning, I tapped on the home button to close the app. No effect. Now serving Crackle Crackers. 
the man said, sounding as if he were holding back tears. Putting the pop in every bite. He took a rectangle wooden block from inside his bathrobe with one hand and drew a gleaming knife with the other. As I watched in bewilderment, he placed the block on the table and proceeded to slice it into neat slices with alarming speed. As the one hand fluttered the knife across the table, the other reached into the growing pile of wooden rectangles and drew a handful out. Putting the pop in every bite, he repeated with exactly the same intonation, and threw the handful into his mouth. He chewed slowly, maintaining direct eye contact with the camera. It felt as if he were staring right at me. Thoroughly freaked out, I waited for some punchline, but none came. The man finished slicing up the block, put the knife back into the depths of his bathrobe, and started eating the rest of the chips. Then the feed suddenly cut out and I was back to watching my show. I decided that I had had enough of the internet for the night and powered my phone off. I lay awake for a bit, wondering if I had only found that advertisement so disturbing because of how late it was. I'd probably missed something that would be obvious when I saw it again sometime the next day. I rose at the sound of my alarm and headed to work, somewhat groggy from staying up so late. I set up Google Maps on my car to check out any traffic delays, and seeing that the coast was clear, I drove off the way I always did. The voice of the electronic assistant spoke at every intersection, guiding me along a route I already knew, but as I moved to turn right on the main street, it suddenly recalculated and instructed me to take a left. What? I muttered. Staring down at the console, no matter how severe traffic had become, there was no way that traveling down the rural back roads that way would make up lost time. I traced out the blue route, zooming the map out, and saw that it wasn't heading toward my office at all. Selected Destination 254 Helton Street It ran. I shut the system off, feeling my heartbeat start to rise. What was going on? If someone was messing with me, it would have to be one of the more elaborate pranks I had ever seen. Or heard about, for that matter. I couldn't seem to escape that address for the rest of the day. On any website I went to, at least one of the advertisements would always be the man in the bathroom, standing now against an all-black background with that same dismayed expression and the address printed out in white text below him. There was no other information, no agency or publisher. My suggested searches weren't helping either. How to get to 254 Helton Street? Best route to 254 Helton Street. What happened at 254 Helton Street? I pulled up a private tab, but the suggestions remained there too. Staring around the brightly lit office, I mustered the courage to search for the address. Google popped up with the No Results Found page. Not entries of other Helton Streets or anything close to it, but only the error message that I must have misspelled something. I started to avoid my phone over the next couple of days just to be safe, but that didn't help at all. On one occasion, I was watching live cable television downstairs when the ad cut to the man, his facial hair longer now, his lips dry and cracked. 254 Helton Street, he screamed, with enough force that this time he broke into a fit of prolonged coughing. For minutes on end he remained doubled over, hacking his lungs away until a small puddle of saliva had formed on the surface of the table. We're out of crackers, he said slowly once he had recovered. But other items remain. Try the new summer fun pops, now with five new fruity flavors. He drew out a tray from below the table containing the dirtiest patch of ice I had ever seen. He dug his fingernails into the surface, scraping away tiny flakes, then cupped them into his mouth and swallowed. Again, he reached down, more frantically now, trying to tear chunks away from the material with no success. Please come quickly to get the best offer on these items. 
I fiddled with the remote to no effect as he stood, clawing at the blackened ice, repeating that last statement over and over with robotic accuracy. I finally stood up and unplugged the TV, and as the image darkened, I could have sworn that his face fell even further. I straightened and decided that I had to do something about this. Reaching carefully from my phone, I opened Google and looked at the newest suggestion, Death at 254 Helton Street. Swallowing dryly, I clicked on it and a single article popped up with no source. It wasn't more than a few sentences long, and it told the story of a somebody discovering the body of a loner on the edge of town after he accidentally locked himself in his basement. He had died of starvation, but evidently, not without lack of trying. The police later found gnaw marks on a pile of ice leading out from behind the door, the spat out remnants of cut up wooden beams, and even a half eaten football lying on the corner. There was no date attached, but the article said that the person had died only a few days ago. What would happen if I visited him? Does he want to be freed from his tomb? Or. Is he looking for the next item to snack on? I saw my dead friend online on Xbox. Where do I even start? I'm scared and for all I know, I am screwed. Typing this is my only way of coping with the situation. I can't even leave the house until the police arrive, especially when he is outside. The police are taking forever and eventually, their front door won't hold anymore. I should have never messaged my friend Alex back, especially since he is very much dead. Alex messaging me should have been the first red flag. Anything related to Alex still hurts to talk about. Part of me believes that his death was definitely not him taking himself out. We were close, and I knew him to be an enthusiastic, funny person. People say that being funny can be a mask for depression, but I knew this wasn't the case. We made all sorts of promises that we'd have each other's backs. He suddenly vanished for weeks, and then they found his body in a nearby river near his house. Apparently nature took its toll on his body, and we couldn't even see him for the last time. My parents started to cry for him, and I even start to imagine the pain of his parents. Alex's parents couldn't talk about his death, and most of us believe that it was because of grief. After his funeral, after I said goodbye, my parents received a strange visit from a man in a black suit. My parents refused to talk about it. My mom seemed to ask other questions about anything else. My dad straight up got angry. I often wondered if we were in any sort of danger. We moved just two weeks after the funeral. It was sudden. My dad came home with a worried look and said to my mom that it was time. We left most of our belongings behind. There was no time to say goodbye to our friends and family. I packed my backpack with clothes and other valuable things. I distinctly remember yanking my Xbox at the last second and jolting towards the door. Everything I had done with my friend was held within the Xbox and I couldn't possibly leave it behind. What took you so long? My mother asked. I didn't respond and we left the house and headed straight towards the car. While the dinner on the table was still warm, my father didn't tell me where we were going. We spent days on the road, driving and driving. Eventually, we reached a home, a lone building near the coastline. The house was big and already furnished. It was beautiful. A year after Alex's death, we lived in a new home, across the country in California. We originally lived in Pennsylvania. My parents still refused to talk about anything related to Alex. I was playing on my Xbox, Rainbow Six Siege a game me and Alex used to play all the time. Whenever I would scroll through my friend list, I would see his name on the top. Listed as favorites. Good times 211 was offline forever. He would never come back. 
or at least I thought. My parents were always looking for something. They were always cautious. My parents left for a business trip. It was urgent and apparently really important. So I had the house for myself, but before they left, they told me if I felt like I was in any danger. The shotgun was in the basement. I was playing a casual game when Alex messaged me. I froze. Confusion and terror washed over me. Immediately I thought, Alex can't actually be messaging me. I left the game and opened the message. Hola, he messaged. The text in a bubble of green. Me. Who are you? I'm Alex. Long time no see. You already forgot about me? You aren't Alex. Alex has been dead for a year. Yes, I am 100% dead. You are talking to a zombie. Whatever you are doing with my friend's account, this isn't a funny joke. You need to stop. And then they just responded with LOL. I started to type stop when he sent me an invitation to join the party, which is a group call you can do on Xbox. It was very horrifying. I was nervous about what would happen if I actually opened up the invitation, so I declined it. He sent another invitation. Then another. Curiosity got the better of me and I opened the invitation, expecting it to be some sick joke. I wish it had been. Just an ear-hurting symphony of painful noises. At first, it was silly sounding noises. Noises that would be used in some sort of cartoon. Then it became sounds of low-pitched screaming and distortion. All of the noises were as loud as my headset could produce. Within 10 seconds after I joined the party, the noises stopped. It became noises of heavy, angry breathing. I took off my headset and ran to my phone, which was charging in my bedroom. My parents needed to know. The phone was already on. On it were multiple notifications. My dad texted, You need to leave the house immediately. Following that message was, He found you. Below the text messages were notifications from Ring, and a lot of them too. The first few were, there is a motion detected at your doorbell cam. There is motion detected at your driveway. And there is motion detected at your backyard. I left my room and looked outside and a man stood in the middle of the road. He looked like he was staring at me and he was holding something. His appearance was dark as the orange street light illuminated the surroundings. He started to walk closer. The light of the house slowly veiled his figure, a man with a huge, threatening grin. His eyes were wide and void. He looked to be a middle-aged white man. He wore a black trench coat and a brown fedora. His wide eyes looked up to me. I was paralyzed in fear. Who the hell is that? What is he holding? Is that a gun? His arms raised towards the window like he knew I was there and shot a couple rounds. The ear-piercing noises, unmistakable sounds of a bullet popping with each bullet. The glass shattered, and I sprinted towards my room and locked the door. I had no time to get the shotgun. I called the police, but all I heard was the strange, loud noises. I tried calling my mom, my dad, anyone really. All of them kept transferring to that forbidden noise. The noises I heard on the Xbox. Right now, I am inside my room underneath the bed. The door kept pounding, but then a big banging noise blasted through the house. Then I got a notification from Ring informing me that the entry delay is in process. Another notification came from an unknown number. Found you. My bedroom door was slammed open. I opened my closet to a wormhole the other day. It was generic like in the movies. Big four foot black hole in the middle, with galaxy like purple spirals slowly turning around it. I just stood there blinking. I rubbed my eyes, but it was still there. 
I tried waving my hand in it to see if I was hallucinating, but my fingers disappeared as they went into the blackness. I guess I'm not getting my jacket, I thought. I finished getting ready for work and walked out into the winter air. I'm close to work, a three minute walk, so I didn't drive. I sat in my cubicle thinking about it. It was hard to focus on working. I ended up my eight hour shift with a short stack of papers left that I didn't do because I was so distracted. Luckily I was using good with getting things done on time and my boss was cool so I'd be okay. I walked home to my apartment on the second floor and immediately went to my bedroom. I needed to see if I was hallucinating still. I opened the door and the eerily silent apparition was still there. That was one thing. It was dead silent, which made it less real. I just stared for a few seconds, then closed the door. I played video games for a few hours and then went to bed. The next day I didn't have work, so I was just going to chill all day, but this wormhole was eating away at me. The first thing I did after getting out of bed was opening the door. This time curiosity got the better of me and I decided to step through. When I stepped through the blackness, I was facing my open closet door from the inside of the closet. It was like a mirror. I took a couple steps into my room, then turned around. The purple spirals were now red. I looked around and everything was good. Nothing different. Weird. I went to the computer and turned it on. That's when things went south and fast. Everything on the computer with writing was flipped, like I was reading it through a mirror. I sat there bewildered for a second. Then I got up and went to the kitchen to look at a calendar to check the words on that too. Flipped. No biggie, I thought. Just go back through. So I went back to the bedroom and stepped through, with the same mirrored thing happening. But this time the spirals were bright banana yellow. I... oh no. I said to myself. The computer was still on, but this time both text was mirrored, and the wallpaper was flipped too. Now I started to panic. This time I ran through. Now the entire bedroom was mirrored on top of everything. I ran out of the room not paying attention to the new color. My whole apartment was flipped. So long story short, I kept running through, the color changing each time. Now the flipping has gotten too bad, I'm walking around on the ceiling. I managed to figure out my phone to make this post and call for help. If anyone has any idea of what to do, I would appreciate it. I'm afraid to go back through, and I would have to climb into the closet now. And I am afraid to go outside because I'm worried that I'll fall into the sky. What should I do?